Think of a long-term base in space and everyone thinks of the International Space Station, which has been the longest and most successful space program so far. But the hard-earned lessons that have kept the ISS continuously manned for over 20 years came from one of our very first attempts to live in space longer than just a few weeks, with America's first orbiting space workshop, Skylab. However, Skylab became known more for the things that went wrong than the things that went right. Problems that started just minutes into its launch and then years later, just before it burned up. This is the story of Skylab and why it's probably one of the most important space missions we've ever done. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Apollo was a great success for both the US and humanity to take the huge leap from orbiting the Earth for a few days to visiting our nearest celestial neighbour. Now, whilst we had shown we could get to and land a man on the moon, the total amount of time we'd spent in space on each Apollo mission was still very short. The longest mission, Apollo 17, spent just three days on the surface and just nine days traveling in space. The talk at the time was that this could be the springboard to visiting other planets, in particular Mars. Whilst the moon is 384,000 kilometers away and about three days traveling time, to get to Mars takes about seven months one way and about the same again back. We had no idea of what living in weightless conditions of space for well over a year would do to the human body or if it could be done at all. Well before we ever got into space, the use of a space station as a staging post for a trip to Mars had been discussed by Werner von Braun in his 1952 book Project Mars, and up until the 1960s it was thought that a space station of some sort would be an important early step in space exploration. However, the politics of the Cold War dictated that the US should beat the Soviets to the moon by the end of the decade, and the idea of a dedicated space station was put to one side. Although the US may have won the race to the moon, the Soviets were the first to put a space station into orbit with the ill-fated Salyut 1 in 1971. However, it had to be abandoned by Soyuz 11 crew after just 23 days due to problems including a fire, and the crew were sadly killed by asphyxia whilst returning to Earth when a valve in their Soyuz capsule failed, and they remain the only people so far to have died in space. Back in the US, Werner von Braun, who had started out in the 1950s with the idea of a large rotating space station like we see in the film 2001, had already worked out plans that would become part of the Apollo applications program, to convert the second stage fuel tank of a Saturn rocket into an orbital workshop, and with the cancellation of the later Apollo missions 18, 19 and 20, it freed up the now spare Saturns to create Skylab, and also use the Apollo command and service modules to transport the crew to and from it. Skylab would fill in the gap between Apollo and the space shuttle which was due in 1979. It would not only be a laboratory to find out how living in space would affect the human body, it would also carry the Apollo telescope mount and solar observatory to study the sun in greater detail than ever before in both the ultraviolet and X-ray spectrums outside of the Earth's atmosphere, something that would become prescient of Skylab's ultimate fate in 1979. Skylab was launched on May 14, 1973, to be followed by the crew on another launch the next day, but almost immediately it ran into problems when a micrometeorite shield and sunshade accidentally deployed during the launch, which was immediately ripped off by the slipstream as it travelled at several thousand kilometres per hour. Once in orbit and within an hour of the launch, more problems became apparent. With no heat shield, the temperature of the workshop was rising dramatically, and a pair of solar arrays were not functioning correctly, which later turned out that one had been pulled off by the departing sunshade. NASA was now into a repair mission and had to delay the next day crew launch whilst they figured out if 
and how it was possible to fix the problems and save Skylab. Over the next 10 days, teams around the US worked day and night to come up with a solution to fix the missing solar shield. The idea was to make a parasol that would be attached to the side of a workshop and then open it up to provide the shade required. As this was being done, the backup crew practiced the operations in the Skylab underwater simulator to both fit the parasol and also fix the solar array. 10 days later, the crew mission of Skylab 2 lifted off to try and rescue the $2.5 billion program. If they couldn't fix the problems, then it would spell the end of Skylab. Nothing like this had been done before. On the Apollo 13 mission, the crew had managed to jerry-rig CO2 scrubbers together with what they could find around the command module. On the Skylab mission, they would be working in space. And although they had an idea of what was wrong, they wouldn't know exactly until they got there. Once the crew arrived and on a televised fly around, they confirmed that the solar shield was indeed gone, as well as one of the solar arrays, and the other was jammed by a strap, which was part of the now missing solar shield. The crew managed to fix the parasol in place and release the stuck solar array, bringing the temperature down in the workshop to acceptable levels and providing enough power for the mission to continue. NASA had learned that it was possible to work in space and fix problems that relied upon the crew's initiative, something that would prove invaluable for future missions, not only in assembling the ISS, but also fixing the Hubble Space Telescope, another multi-billion dollar program that had to be fixed in space. Once Skylab was functioning, it could carry on its work, but it was hardly what you would call luxurious. It was basically a giant aluminium can in which the crew would eat, sleep and work, with one window, onboard excrement store and somewhat bland food. This large open space did allow them to do things that are not possible now on the ISS, such as running around the wall and doing acrobatics. One of the things they discovered was if someone was spun around in a chair, then they would not get dizzy like they would doing the same here on Earth. This showed that the inner ear relied on gravity to work. Hundreds of experiments were carried out over the three missions on everything from exercise in space, to Earth resources looking down at the Earth, to material sciences like welding in space and growing crystals. Each of the three crewed missions stretched the limit of human spaceflight endurance, with Skylab 2 lasting 28 days, Skylab 3 56 days, and Skylab 4 for 84 days. For the first time, we had a place to conduct experiments into all aspects of living in space for longer periods of time. Not only into how it affects the human body, but how we could work in microgravity and how it affects materials and processing of things that will be needed, like growing plants for food. There were also student requested experiments like bringing spiders on board to see if they could build their webs in zero gravity. In fact, it only took them a day or so to go from making a chaotic mess of a web to making one that looked pretty much like they did here on Earth. One astronaut commented that they adapted to zero gravity a lot quicker than the humans and without the months of training. Skylab had enough oxygen, food, and water to last 24 man months, though in the end, they only used 16 months of the supplies. Before departing for the last time, the Skylab 4 crew left food and provisions for the next crew, which never happened, and left the hatch unlocked. They also used the Apollo command and service module to boost the orbit by 11 kilometers and leave it in a parking orbit. It was known that without further booster operations, Skylab would eventually fall back to Earth, but this was not expected to occur until about 1983, and the space shuttle was due to come into service in 1979 to boost Skylab's orbit. To do this, the Teleoperator Retrieval System, or TRS, was ordered by NASA in 1977 for use in late 1979. This was a remotely controlled space tug that was designed to move payloads around in space and boost or deorbit spacecraft or satellites. 
The idea was that this space lab could be saved, it could be used as the core of a new larger space station. But despite having the world's best sun observatory on Skylab, NASA ignored warnings in 1973 by the British mathematician Desmond King Helly of the Royal Aircraft Establishment, the RAE, that it would return in 1979, and again by NORAD in 1977, who revised their date to mid-1979 due to the effect of the largest increase in solar activity in a century. Basically, with more energy coming from the sun, the more the Earth's upper atmosphere heated up and this expanded outwards, causing slightly more drag on Skylab. This would cause it to slow down, only very slightly, but enough to lower its orbit more quickly than expected, and instead of deorbiting in 1983, it was now going to be sometime in 1979. Problems with the space shuttle meant that it was going to be delayed and would not be available to take the TRS to boost Skylab's orbit, so the TRS was cancelled. The TRS could have been launched on a Titan or Atlas Agena and controlled from Earth, but the idea was dropped as budgets were cut and Skylab was left to a fiery fate a few years later. The debacle that was Skylab returning to Earth also showed that NASA needed to learn lessons on how to predict and handle the return of a large piece of what was now space debris. There was a plan to have fuel on board Skylab to allow it to have a more controlled re-entry, but that was later dropped because of the fear that it might cause danger to the crews on board. This left NASA with less control of where it would eventually end up on Earth. As the time approached, this caused a media frenzy as people who were under Skylab's flight path were concerned that it might fall on them. Just a few hours before the event, NASA adjusted Skylab's orientation to take it on a path that would fly across the US and drop it into the southern Atlantic, about 1,300 kilometers south-southeast of Cape Town, South Africa, to avoid flying over the more densely populated areas of Europe and onto China. However, due to a 4% margin of error in the calculations, and that the main part of Skylab took much longer to burn up than expected, it carried along its flight path and over the southern Indian Ocean where parts of it fell, but some continued on towards southwestern Australia where they fell over an area stretching from the town of Esperance on the coast to Rowena, some 300 kilometers in a northeasterly direction. Many pieces were found by local people, with some saying that NASA had planned to land it there rather than over the US, because it was more sparsely populated. But in reality, you could see that it was just at the end of its flight path, and that if it had been controlled more accurately with onboard fuel, it could have been dropped into the ocean quite easily. Although it was fraught with problems, NASA was able to make good on what could have been an expensive and humiliating failure and apply what it learned to future missions. If Skylab had been lost just after its launch, it would have set us back years, and even with the Space Shuttle's extended duration orbiter program, which was never fully utilized for month-long durations, it still wouldn't have compared to the 510 man days which were spent on Skylab. The knowledge gained through NASA was open to everyone in the world, and soon the Soviets would use it to help them build a succession of new Salyut and Mir space stations, culminating in the Zvezda, which became part of the core of the Russian part of the ISS. This, along with modules from the US, Europe, and Japan, forms the basis of the ISS, and what we know about individuals continuously living in space for almost two and a half years, which will be invaluable for traveling to Mars in the not too distant future and which is why it could be said that Skylab is probably one of the most influential space programs so far. NASA learned many things from Skylab. One of them was the feasibility of doing an EVA to fix mission level failures. Before they launched, they had a list of situations that they thought were no-goes, and one of them was doing an EVA down the side of a module to fix something like a solar array. But the problem they saw at Mission Control was that the array was working, but just not deploying. They thought that it might be possible to fix the issue with some specially adapted tools. So they took a calculated risk 
And with those tools, it was possible to do the EVA and release the stuck solar array. This process of fixing a problem that you think isn't possible is the same as when you're learning a new skill. And the sponsor of this video, Brilliant, can help you do just that. Brilliant is a fun problem solving website and app, so you're not tied to the desktop and you can help develop those learning skills anywhere. Their courses are laid out a bit like a story and broken down into pieces so that you can tackle them a little bit at a time. There's no big deal here, there's no tests or grades. And if you make a mistake along the way, you just need to check out the explanations to find out more. Recently, Brilliant has been upping the interactivity on their platform to a new level, and they continue improving their courses to add more interactivity to them with ones like this, and there are many more like this. So if you want to support Curious Droid and join a community of over 8 million learners, you can get unlimited access to all of Brilliant's in-depth courses and learning by heading on over to brilliant.org forward slash Curious Droid and following the sign up link. So I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, then please thumbs up, subscribe and share and don't forget to ring that bell notification. Now, if you're a patron to Curious Droid, we are now releasing all of our videos ad free and before they appear on YouTube for patrons only. We're also going through our back catalogue and doing the same, so you'll probably find your favourite video up there at some point in the future, or maybe even now. So it just remains for me to say a big thank you to all of our patrons out there for their ongoing support.